Welcome to the Startup Grind. All right. There we go here. How y'all doing today? Great. I love saying y'all. Brings me back to my North Carolina roots. Um, though I'm not from there. Um, can I have a show of hands? You, I'm kind of blinded by the light right now, but just to get a sense, raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur. Who's here? All right, and raise your hand if you're an investor, VC. All right, a few out there. Okay, good. So whenever you get a room together of entrepreneurs and VCs, there's a very popular topic that constantly comes up, and that's the topic of funding. So can you guys see my, my presentation? Okay, yeah, here we go. Uh, so that's what we're gonna talk about. We're actually gonna talk about funding, and specifically the future of funding. But kind of have some bad news. Oh, something messed up there. Anyways, um, what I wanted to show here is uh, some interesting statistics. Uh, about over 99% of private companies actually never receive venture financing. Um, I think something like six to 800 companies last year received it, um, but two million companies got started. So you might be wondering then, um, how do I be that 0.4%? Um, so let's, let's talk about it. But the reason why most, most companies actually don't get venture funding is because they're either not ready um, or they're not right. Um, not right being maybe small businesses like a bakery that just wants to open up an, another store. Not really the, the investment um, opportunity for a venture capitalist. Or maybe you're not ready, like this uh, product called the Gravity Light, which um, I met the inventor behind it. It was this really interesting light that where 30 seconds of lifting creates 30 minutes of energy. Um, a totally all new and alternative uh, form of, of light uh, for the developing world. Uh, but he couldn't get a venture capitalist to call him back. Why? Because the investor wasn't convinced that there was actually a true market for it. So why are venture capitalists hesitant? Why do they only put money into 0.4% of companies that actually start? Well, the big reason is risk, um, and specifically two kinds of risk, uh, market risk and execution risk. So market risk is the risk that you actually have a big market, that there's a lot of people out there that actually want the thing you're making. And execution risk is the risk that you, actually, you and your team can actually figure out a product market fix and get yourself together to actually execute and, and build the product. Um, it's for this reason, though, that, um, that, that investors actually kind of rest on their laurels a little bit and end up only investing in companies that, that have proven markets or um, companies where you're trying to create a product that's maybe just a cheaper, better, faster version of something else. Um, or it's why the investors have biases towards investing in certain uh, people, whether it's um, entrepreneurs with proven track records um, or certain demographics. Um, as we like to say, entrepreneurs are you know, guys in their 20s that are white and dropped out of college, which clearly I don't believe is the case. <laughs> um, so uh, what happens is you, you, if you, you have these biases, and so what happens is you have companies like Indiegogo, which when I was starting the company with my co-founders, we were newbie entrepreneurs. We were trying to actually create a business and create a new market at the same time. We got rejected by 92 venture capitalists before we actually re ever received our first money. And so we were part of the 99% for a good three or four years there um, until things changed. So Indiegogo launched, and um, the reason we launched is we actually wanted to address the 99%. We wanted to help people who were either not right or not ready for venture. Um, we started Indiegogo as um, a global, not, now that's the largest global crowdfunding platform in the world. Um, and it helps people who maybe can't get noticed by a venture capitalist or maybe never want to be noticed. So Emmy's Organics is the example of the bakery that I already talked about. They were, th this was a story of a young woman. She had started her bakery. Um, she had uh, opened up one storefront, had the opportunity to actually distribute her product into, um, into a regional grocery store. The problem is she needed $15,000 to update her packaging in order to do it, and as a young small business that only is, was running on $10,000 of working capital, she just didn't have the money. She actually got rejected for a loan from a bank because she was too high risk, and instead she turned to Indiegogo, raised the $15,000 by offering macaroons as perks, um, and was able to actually get her macaroons into the regional grocery store chain because she was able to update her packaging within a couple months, and within six months she was distributing her product across 40 states in America. Um, so Indiegogo was able to surf her. Um, and then we also had the gravity light, which is what I told you about, this light that, you know, uh, the VC said, sounds like a great idea, but I have actually no idea if the world wants it. 
uh, Patrick, the designer, went on Indiegogo, raised the $400,000, and is now producing lights and, and proving that, that he does. So Indiegogo clearly is a great option, a, an alternative funding source for entrepreneurs that are either not right or not ready for venture, which is probably not news to anybody here anymore, and you're probably all sitting here like, okay, tell me something new. Um, but if money was all what Indiegogo was about, then I wouldn't be standing up here, because there's actually a big secret. Um, it, crowdfunding is actually not about the money. And let me start with a story. So this is the Misfit Shine. This is an elegant activity uh, tracker that a man by the name of Sunny Vu and his team came up with. Um, he needed $100,000 uh, to uh, get his product into the market and fund the initial production. Uh, so he went on Indiegogo and actually was incredibly successful. He ended up raising $846,000, well over his $100,000 goal. But in the process of raising over nearly $900,000 from over 8,000 people, uh, what he, the way he did it is he started to offer different perks throughout the campaign. He actually offered his activity tracker um, as a perk, and he actually offered different colors, black, silver, and other. Um, and when certain versions sold out, he actually would add the same exact version again at a higher price point and see when people would start stop funding it. He also learned in the process that he, um, his funders, which are technically his customers, uh, they said they wanted, uh, they wanted to see uh, different accessories. They specifically wanted to see necklaces and bracelets. And he said, you know, the whole point of me designing this activity tracker was to make it elegant and hidden in your clothes so that no one can see it. So he found himself, or heard himself, kind of fighting with his customers. And so rather than fight with them, he said, well, let's just put it to the test. So in the middle of the campaign, he actually added a perk for a necklace and a bracelet, and overnight they sold out. And so in the process, what he learned is um, he learned who his customers were. He actually was able to test his pricing and learn the willingness to pay of what people wanted. He actually learned that the silver version of the shine, people far preferred, over, or people far preferred the black version of the shine over the silver version, which was shocking to him. Um, they were even willing to pay $50 more for it than the silver. And he also discovered a whole new uh, revenue stream, the accessories, which he, he, in his, his mind totally was not an opportunity whatsoever. And so what Indiegogo did is it actually made him smarter faster, in his own words. He was able to identify influencers, people who really uh, supported the idea. He was able to kind of build the brand. The number of press hits he got through the campaign was enormous. He couldn't buy that type of marketing. He tested his pricing. He tested his features. And he raised almost a million dollars. Granted, that's non-dilutive capital. So it didn't have to give up any equity ownership for it. So essentially, what he did is he used Indiegogo to reduce market risk as well as execution risk. The risk that there wasn't a market there, he clearly proved it. And the risk that he didn't know exactly what his customers wanted and was able to, to prove that as well. So essentially, what Indiegogo is actually doing, because of its ability to actually reduce or mitigate market and execution risks, is it's actually becoming an incubation platform. Um, a great example of this is the Scanadu Scout. Uh, this is a campaign that um, anybody watch Star Trek? Woohoo! Yeah. OK. Anybody remember the tricorder? All right, it now exists, because it's in Indiegogo. Um, so the tricorder is, the, is like the first ever doctor in your pocket. It kind of reads your, your vital signs, et cetera. It's totally from Star Trek, and now it exists in 2014. Um, so the team behind this, it was actually a married couple behind this. They went on Indiegogo to really prove that there was a market for this. They raised the $1.6 million uh, by offering the ability to be a beta tester of some of their early products. And uh, just a few months later, or within a year later, um, they used that to then parlay that into a, a larger venture round. They just raised ten and a half million dollars um, from VC, all because they're able to get their start, prove their market, mitigate their execution and market risk using Indiegogo. Um, and because of these benefits, uh, Indiegogo is now also becoming an incredible market testing platform. So we actually had a campaign called uh, the Kite Patch, which is this really cool uh, patch. It's an alternative to mosquito nets. Um, where it's a patch you put on your arm, similar to like a nicotine patch, and uh, it emits these um, uh, rays such that it, be, it makes you invisible to mosquitoes so they can't smell you. Um, and so this campaign actually had raised traditional financing, it had gone to the gate to Bill and Melinda Gates and raised about $100,000. But then they still came back to Kite Patch because they wanted to get smarter faster. They wanted to really understand 
um, their messaging, they really want to understand the product market fit, they really want to understand what their, what their users wanted. And so they did that and they ended up raising um, over $600,000. Um, I forgot, I didn't mention, but that Misfit Shine that I, that I mentioned just a, a little bit ago, they too used it for this, for this reason. They had actually raised seven million in venture financing before they did Indiegogo. So that million dollars um, basically, yes, was non-dilutive capital, but it made them smarter, faster, and uh, it essentially um, it got them to market much more quickly and gave them the confidence that they're actually building something the world wanted. So I've been saying, you know, Indiegogo's great, it's great for people who are not ready for, for, for venture capital, maybe people not right for venture capital, and now I'm showing you that it's actually great for people with venture capital um, to still use it to get smarter faster. Um, but now I'm actually gonna say something kind of bold in that um, people are now starting to use Indiegogo as a way to completely bypass venture capital. Um, so an example here is the Bluetooth Edge. This is the largest crowdfunding campaign, I think, in the history of crowdfunding, which, again, is only six years old because we started in January 2008. Um, and this was a campaign uh, for this interesting mobile um, operating system that connects with your devices seamlessly. And the, and the team behind Ubuntu said, let's go see if we, we can, uh, if we have a market to make our own phone to go with our operating system. Um, and they said, you know, we know to make this work, um, we need $30 million. And if we don't, if we can't raise $30 million, that means our market's not big enough. Um, for the phone. And so they went on Indiegogo and they ended up raising about almost $13 million. Um, and so not quite, clearly not enough, didn't reach the $30 million, but in the process, um, they learned a couple things. No, they didn't quite have the big enough market, so they actually saved themselves a lot of time and, and wasted money taking venture that then would have invested into developing a phone with not a good, sizable market. Um, but in the process, they le learned a ton about their customers. And so going forward, no matter what what type of um, device they come out with, they're always going to use Indiegogo as a way to test um, to make sure that they're, they're coming out with something that the world wants and their customers actually want. So what's actually happening, or what we're seeing happening, is that there's now a shift happening in this kind of the economy of finance, um, and that's cash is actually becoming a commodity. Uh, when, now that crowdfunding is on the scene, um, it's bringing benefits that other traditional investors can't bring. Uh, for example, the crowd is bringing the market validation, the market testing, the price, uh, pricing info, the, the, the feature feedback, all data you can't spend enough to buy. Um, it's bringing that. And so the question is, um, what are venture capitalists bringing? And I think they're still bringing a ton, but what with relationships and expertise and how to you know, truly build, build companies. But what's happening is the whole system is then getting a little bit more honest. Um, the sources of capital cannot rely on just being uh, valuable because they're a provider of capital. They actually have to add value on top of that. And the importance of that value is only increasing. A good example of this is the Canary Security System. So this is a, this is a, a company that, um, it's a home security uh, system, like a smart home security system. And these guys actually had uh, gotten a term sheet from a, from a VC and they're pretty excited about it, but then they're actually reading the terms, and they're like, oh, this is not very good. Oh, this is not very good at all. Like, whoa, why would we take money? Like, pretty much giving up our entire company here. Um, so they said, let's hold back on that, and let's turn, and they went to Indiegogo, and they ended up raising 1.9 million, and I think the story is like, the VCs got so freaked out that they tried to like send the money into their bank account uh, before the campaign was over on the original terms, and the guys were like, whoa, stop. Um, but what ended up happening was that, um, they are able to re re return to the negotiating table and actually completely change all the terms in their favor. And it really made the VCs step up um, and, and prove that they can add value as well, um, whether it's relationships, expertise, all that good stuff. So the question is, you know, are you worried? Who's the VC out here? <laughs> I'm not trying to threaten your job security here, I promise. Um, there is a role, and it's actually, I think, even a better role than, than your role in the past. Um, we'll get to it in a second. But what I'm really trying to say is what Indiegogo is trying to do here um, is we're trying to completely decentralize finance. Similar to how eBay decentralized commerce or YouTube decentralized video distribution, we're trying to put the power back into the hands of the many to decide what ideas matter, what ideas should be funded, and which ideas should come to life. And when, we're, when we do that, the whole financial ecosystem, ecosystem is far more efficient and far more fair. So what's gonna, what we're seeing and what we're kind of helping catalyze is similar to what we saw in the cable industry, where we first originally saw 
Um, you know, there's three pretty much channels, NBC, ABC, and CBS. If you wanted to watch television in the, you know, 50 years ago, you had three options, that's it. Kind of the media content creators had all the control. Then we saw cable move onto the scene, so there's more options. Uh, means the content creators had to compete a little harder to provide good content. And then you saw YouTube come onto the scene, which completely decentralized everything and gave everybody the power to be a uh, content creator. Um, similar in writing with the New York Times, you know, we had a, a, a few um, pr providers of news, then blogging came, everybody could provide news, and now Twitter. It's totally uh, democratized information sharing. So that's what we're seeing in finance. With the banks, the VCs, there's a few, you know, 80 years ago, there's only a few people who would provide capital. So what happened was capital kind of got bottlenecked, and, um, and investors kind of got a bad rap as being gatekeepers people who say no rather than saying yes. And so what we're trying to move towards is a world where everyone is technically is a gatekeeper, but everyone is a, is a, is a purveyor of yes. So everyone is, is funding whatever matters to them. And so with that, in that world, what we're seeing then is um, everyone is becoming an influencer. Um, here you have an example of Engadget, which is an outlet that is now promoting a campaign here, Airtame. Um, which actually won an award at CES, and they raised over a million dollars on Indiegogo. They're out of Denmark. Um, what you're seeing is um, everybody from the New York Times to Engadget to VCs, we're all gonna sit next to each other being the curators of amazing ideas and the curators of amazing campaigns. And we're all gonna turn into funders ourselves. Everyone is gonna become a bank. So what I like to say is the future of funding is all of us funding the future together. And when that happens, you actually make finance a lot more fair. You level the playing field. The certain demographics or the, uh, or the certain types of companies that maybe weren't getting the attention because of those biases um, that, that often VCs have to bring to mitigate execution risk and market risk, those, that stuff goes away. One thing I'm, one of the, a stat that I'm most proud of, I think, on Indiegogo is that I know here, um, at least in the States, only three to eight percent of venture-backed companies have a woman on their executive team. Well, in Indiegogo, 48 percent of successful funding campaigns are run by women. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when you create this level playing field, this open playing field where anybody, any idea can rise to the top based on how hard work, hustle, and how much the world actually wants it, you turn the game of investing in, from a game of a few people trying to guess what the world wants to an exercise of the world actually funding what they want, um, which then makes everything far more efficient. And the best thing, though, about all of this, though, is really what's going to happen to our whole world, is that when everyone's a funder or everyone's a campaign owner, what we're actually going to do is be far more engaged in our life, and we're actually going to shape the world around us. Um, in a far more engaged way. And so the ideas that are coming to life are the ones that we actually want, which is a much more efficient system. Um, a little tip, I know most of these, um, most of the people here in the audience are entrepreneurs. Um, I know a lot of this day is gonna be about uh, two things. Uh, uh, what to build and how to build it. Everything from growth hacking, to A-B testing, to lean startup methodology, to all that stuff, all amazing stuff, I use it all. <laughs> In Indiegogo, I was actually in Steve Blank's class when I was starting Indiegogo, super valuable. But the one thing um, I found in kind of trying to start a company um, is that um, I didn't hear, hear the following a lot, and I wish I had, and I'm glad we ended up doing it, but my advice to all of you is make sure you pay attention to, to the what and the how, that's, that's very important. But don't forget to ask yourself the question, why? Why are you doing this? Uh, when, in, when my co-founders and I decided to start Indiegogo, we had this vision to de completely democratize finance and decentralize it, and literally empower everybody to fund what matters to them, whatever that is, whoever you are, wherever you are, however you like to fund it. And I honestly think that it was um, the bringing together of the three, the why, the, the, the why, the what, and the how, that actually made us successful. Um, and why we raised $40 million last week um, from very established, well-regarded um, venture capitalists who I adore because they do bring a ton of expertise and relationships and guidance already. They're making an impact. Um, but I just want to leave you with this thought. One thing that John Doerr told us uh, before he invested in us was um, something that has still stuck with me and what I hope will stick with you. 
Um, he, um, you all know, is a legendary investor. And he said to us, um, regardless of whether or not I have the opportunity to invest in you guys, what I want you to know is that you've, you've built a really important company for the world. And so in your quest to start a company, to you know, mitigate market risk, to mitigate execution risk, to make sure you've got a big enough market and to make sure you've got a good product market fit and you've got the right team in order, um, make sure that you're also asking yourself why. Because I think the most successful companies um, are not the ones that have the biggest market and the best product market fit, but it's, it's the ones that have that um, and it's the ones that are actually building something truly important for the world. So good luck. Ask yourself why. If you haven't, don't move forward on your business unless you get clarity on that. And if you need tips on how to ask yourself why, happy to give it to you. Thank you.